Hello and good morning from Manila and the Asian Development Bank. Welcome to the 74th Asian Impact Webinar, the Asian Development Policy Lecture by Karen Grohn. I'm Hema Swaminathan, Senior Gender Economist at the Economic Research and Development Impact Department at the Asian Development Bank. For the AIW today, we have a topic that resonates with many countries around the world, the thorny issue of women's labor force participation. Academics and policymakers have been grappling with this issue for a while, and the 2023 Nobel Prize in Economics to Professor Claudia Golden has focused a spotlight on women and labor market inequalities. Professor Golden's research shows us that economic growth did not always increase women's workforce participation in the United States. Women's work declined during the transition from agriculture to manufacturing, but increased with greater jobs in the service sector. However, despite progress, women continue to earn less than women due to a variety of reasons. Some important ones that were highlighted by Golden's work were the unpaid care economy and the structure of jobs, what she termed as greedy jobs. And the relevance of Golden's work for Asia Pacific and its implications certainly warrants a deep dive. And this is what we are about to do today. Um, webinar attendees uh, will have a chance to interact with the speakers and learn about the relevance of Golden's research on women and work in the United States to women and work in the Asia Pacific, discuss the role of policy and legislation in enhancing women's economic opportunities and its intersection with unpaid care work, and as well as we will shed light on how private sector employers can reduce gender inequalities with examples of good practices. To discuss this topic, we have with us uh, some very interesting speakers. We have a keynote speaker and two panelists who will provide us a range of perspectives. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to emphasize, of course, the importance of your participation. We really want to make this a lively and engaged discussion, and we would like to hear from you, our audience. Please type your questions into the Q&A box, which you can find at the right side or at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to, you can give a thumbs up or like to existing questions, and we will try to address the most popular ones first. But of course, I hope that we will get to all questions. So with this, let me introduce our speakers. Our keynote speaker, Karen Grohn, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute Center for Sustainable Development, is a leading authority on gender and development. Uh, Karen was formerly the global director for gender at the World Bank Group and has had senior roles at the USAID, the US Agency for International Development and the International Center for Research on Women. Grohn's extensive publications include co-editing books such as Taxation and Gender Equity and the Feminist Economics of Trade. She has led significant research projects on aid effectiveness, gender asset gaps, and taxation and gender equality across multiple countries. She is a member of multiple advisory groups and has been named among apolitical gender equality top 10 influencers. She holds bachelor's and doctor's degrees in economics from the New School for Social Research and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California, Los Angeles. We are also joined by two panelists. We have with us Albert Park, Chief Economist at the Asian Development Bank and Director General of its Economic Research and Development Impact Department. Albert Park has more than two decades of experience as a development economist and is a well-known expert on the economy of the People's Republic of China. He has worked on a broad range of development issues, including poverty and inequality, intergenerational mobility, microfinance, migration and labor markets, and the future of work and foreign investment. Um, Albert Park is Chair Professor of Economics, Social Science and Public Policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and served as a founding director of the Institute's at the Institute for Emerging Market Studies and Center for Economic Policy, and has also held previously faculty positions at the University of Oxford and University of Michigan. He received his bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard and his doctorate in applied economics from Stanford University. We are also joined by Maya Jubita, who is Director of Workplace Gender Equality at Investing in Women, a program of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. 
She assists private sector employees, employers in Vietnam, Indonesia, Myanmar, and the Philippines in creating fairer workplaces, attracting and retaining diverse teams, and implementing their ESG strategies. Before joining uh, the Business Coalition, uh, joining IW, Maya was the executive director of the Indonesia Business Coalition for Women Empowerment, which she co-founded in 2016. The Business Coalition unites leading sector companies in Indonesia to advance gender equality in their business practices. During Indonesia's G20 presidency, Maya was appointed an advocate for G20 Empower and policy officer for Women in Business Council of the B20. Maya has a master's degree in business law from the University of Gajah Mada in Indonesia and has worked as an HR professional for over 20 years in private sector and development organization. So having introduced our uh, keynote speaker and our panelists, I know you're eager to hear their thoughts. Let me hand over the floor to Karen now for her presentation. Thank you so much, Hema. I hope everybody can hear me. I'd like to express before I start my um, deepest thanks to the Asian Development Bank for inviting me to give this lecture. Evening my time, morning your time. Uh, my lecture will focus on uh, Claudia Golden's uh, perspectives and uh, her contributions and the relevance of those to women and work in the Asia Pacific uh, region. Um, next slide, uh, please. Uh, she has a long and distinguished uh, career as an economic historian and as um, a labor economist. As you know, she um, has been at Harvard University for uh, many years. Um, she has a terrific body of work, including five books that summarize many of her uh, published articles in prestigious uh, economic uh, journals. Um, I have to say that uh, many in the profession were absolutely thrilled when she was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize. She's only one of three women as you all know, to have received it and the only one to have received it without uh, other colleagues, but on her own. Uh, I think people were also delighted because she, her body of work um, has really corrected an economic, uh, the omission in economic history and in economic reasoning by focusing on what half the population, namely women, do with their time and their resources, uh, what their life cycle patterns are with respect to education, marriage, childbearing, uh, work, paid and unpaid. Uh, and her contributions uh, are not just about that, but they also deal with other issues like racial discrimination in the United States. Um, she's also looked at technological uh, change and other issues. But tonight, I thought I would focus on um, her, a little bit of her research that I think is important. I thought I would pull out some key themes that I think are relevant for the Asia Pacific region, uh, and we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into um, what those suggest, and then talk a little bit about some of the nuances and differences, and maybe some of the issues going forward that, um, will be important to the region, but not necessarily yet reflected in her work. And then I'll wrap up with some concluding thoughts. So let's go to the next slide, please. I thought I would, um, uh, and excuse me if I look over here, I'm having a hard time uh, seeing the screen. Um, I think it's really important to note that uh, the insights um, that she has given us come largely from the lens of history. She has documented the evolution of labor market gender differences, mostly in the United States over time. And she has really highlighted that long-term um, changes in, in the economy uh, highlight the developments, whether they're structural economic transformation, technological change, educational advancement, fertility declines, uh, that are really missed when you take a short-term perspective. And she has some important work that has been very influential for countries around the world called the Feminization U. I'm gonna come to that in a few slides. The other thing that I think is really important about her work is she pioneered a framework 
in which education and fertility and the demand for labor are all connected to women's aspirations and identity over time. So she's not only looking at the supply side of the economy or the demand side of the economy, but she's putting the two together. And she positioned women's labor supply decisions within a life cycle framework, from choices about schooling to labor market, to parenthood, uh, and to uh, uh, even retirement decisions. And this is quite important and looked at the influence of institutional constraints, social norms, and the women's preferences to balance their work life with their family life. So uh, these are all quite important in terms of a body of work over time. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought there would be a few themes from her work that we should pick up and discuss in the context of Asia uh, Pacific. Um, I'm specifically going to be talking about some of her earlier work reflected um, in uh, structural economic transformation, changes in human capital, uh, uh, laws uh, reformed over time with some um, information, some, some data that's relevant to EAP. Uh, this dates back to a 1974 paper that she wrote called The U-Shaped Female Labor Force Function in Economic Development and Economic History that drew on very intensive research from the 1800s all the way up to the 1970s and 1980s, very painstaking archival work that she uh, put uh, together. And then I'm gonna turn to some of her more recent work, which uh, it embodied in Career and Family, uh, that uh, focuses on college-educated married women and what she calls greedy jobs, with some observations on that that I think would be relevant to the countries in this region. Now, I do have some caveats before I uh, delve in. The first is that, as everybody who's on this webinar knows, the Asia-Pacific region is quite heterogeneous, heterogeneous in terms of countries at different levels of income, at different uh, countries that have different types of economic structure, either still being largely agrarian or some which are semi-industrialized or others which are more highly income and economies that um, resemble those in Europe or the OECD. I'm gonna focus somewhat less on the Pacific and on Central Western Asia, Central and Western Asia, and more on the economies in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. So I hope you'll forgive me if I don't go into great detail um, in ways that um, would, uh, where I'm covering the waterfront. So let's go to the next slide, uh, please. Um, here I want to show you um, Claudia Golden's uh, Feminization You. And uh, I have to say that she's actually not the first person um, to have pointed out the feminization you. Actually, there were other sociologists that were working also in the 1970s that had come to similar uh, conclusions about uh, what they call fem feminized um, uh, industries over time. And a number of uh, feminist economists, uh, people like Mila Farshatai, uh, and Gunseli Barrick had also started to uh, point out uh, this uh, feminization view. But the essence of this uh, shows that essentially, and, and this is when she started this analysis, in the period of the 1800s, economies were still largely agriculturally uh, oriented. Women and men worked, they worked in the fields, they worked in the home, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they, women, they didn't have too many uh, other options. But over time, as countries began to industrialize uh, and as more jobs uh, were created in, manu and in the manufacturing sector, women and men both left the home and started to work in paid employment outside. And this chart that you see on your screen uh, charts this uh, transition. So the, the, the economies on the left, the agrarian economies, are still largely at lower levels of income, but as they begin to industrialize, they, they begin to grow. Um, so 
uh, as countries become more middle income, uh, women, uh, some women, for instance, in the US were drawn into the labor force, for instance, in factory employment in the 19, uh, early 1900s and 1920s, uh, but other women actually uh, stayed home and took care of the family, uh, took care of domestic tasks, household labor, and so forth. As countries then began to industrialize even uh, further and trans diversify into services and other sectors of the economy, grow into higher income, women were more absorbed into those uh, labor forces. Um, this happened in, post, in the post-war uh, period of the United States. Um, and one of the things that was quite interesting is that as the U.S. economy, and she's largely studying the U.S. here, is going through this structural economic transformation from agriculture to industry uh, to services, this was being accompanied by other changes happening uh, that would also facilitate women's entry into paid employment. So the first is the fact that women uh, were uh, expanding their education opportunities. Women um, were uh, going not only to primary school, but to graduating um, uh, in secondary education, not yet going on to college, but expanding um, their, their education uh, opportunities. Um, there were changing uh, expectations of what women could or could not uh, do in their work lives. And she has, Claudia Golden has a really important paper about some key, which she, uh, she, she did with others, some key moments historically, the invention, for instance, of, of contraception, the, particularly the pill, which was um, quite uh, easily available. She also has a paper on, um, on the abortion uh, laws in the US, which were quite important to give women control over their fertility and their reproductive lives, which would enable them uh, to work. So these changes accompanied the structural economic uh, transformation uh, in the economy. There's a lot of discussion in the literature about the extent to which the feminization U characterizes particular countries. So for instance, there's been an active discussion in the feminist economic literature in India about whether India has a feminist, uh, has a, um, has a, a feminist, feminized U, feminization U, or whether the countries in the region themselves across countries um, actually uh, display this pattern. So if we go to the next slide, this slide actually um, is a slide that shows you um, a scatter plot of the countries in the region over time, starting in 1995, going to 2005, to 2012, and then to 2021. Um, the countries that are on the upper left of the scatter plot are mostly in the Pacific. Uh, Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu, the Samo Solomon Islands. And it roughly corresponds to economies that are still very reliant on agriculture or environmental uh, and natural uh, resources. There is one country that uh, is in this grouping in 1995, and that's Cambodia. And it's in this grouping because it has a high female to male labor force participation rate, but it has a had at this period of time a quite low GDP. The countries that are on the upper right of the U, and this, by the way, is a very weak U, so it's not a very deep U, are the higher income countries of Australia and Korea, South Korea and Japan, uh, and China over time has graduated into this country, into this category. The countries that are on the bottom uh, left are Afghanistan with a very low female to male participation rate, as well as a low GDP. Uh, Timor-Leste and Bhutan remain on the upper left, and they only grow in GDP, but they're very small changes. And there are some South Asian countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, where the ratio of female to male uh, participation between 1995 and 2005 um, remained uh, pretty constant in 2022, and then they finally went up slightly 
only in 2021. I think it's also worth noting that India remains in the bottom right across the years, uh, and that the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia also remain static across successive years below uh, the U-shape. And then between 1995 and 2005, Myanmar, Uzbekistan, Mongolia, Kyrgyz, and Vietnam had a lower GDP, but they had a higher ratio of female to male labor force participation. And it remained like that in 2012, finally increasing their GDP in 2021, but the ratio of female to male labor force participation declined. So this shows you a very interesting pattern uh, for the region uh, as a whole. If we go to the next slide, we can actually look at sectoral changes uh, as a result of structural economic uh, transformation. And I wanna call out here what I thought was a very nice ADB ILO report on uh, the status of jobs and care work in the Asia Pacific region. And I really like this report because it presents very important data for all of the sub-regions uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, context, uh, but it does so in the context of tracing um, structural uh, economic transformation. And what I think is really nice about this slide is that uh, it shows you the changes in the relative shares of employment across nine sectors of the economy in 2021 compared to 1991 in percentage points in terms of starting points. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about some of what the trends are behind this, but I just wanted to highlight a few things here. First is that you can see that uh, all sub-regions have seen a decline in the share of employment uh, in agriculture to varying degrees. These are the percentages in the red cells, uh, the second uh, row to the bottom. I also have to point out that um, in the early 1990s, the region was characterized by a growth of low value added manufacturing, but over time, uh, women's employment in low value added uh, manufacturing has actually uh, declined, particularly in East Asia, where it had previously been hot, um, high uh, and uh, uh, still about constant in uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, but with losses in the Pacific and Central and Western uh, Asia. But I think this is a really nice slide because it, um, it indicates those uh, sectors that have declines in employment shares as well as the growth shares uh, for female and male employment. The other thing I wanted to point out here that Golden does, but then I think this is great, is that while she analyzes trends in female employment, it's always relative, relative to male employment um, and relative um, historically to uh, previous uh, to the past. So um, this is a really important way, I think, of presenting data. If we go to the next slide, what are some of the uh, uh, drivers of structural economic transformation, particularly in Asia. There's a huge body of work pioneered by people like Jayati Ghosh, Stephanie Seguino, Gonsele Barak, uh, the ADB uh, economists, who essentially say that, uh, have pointed out that, and Alice Amston, of course, that the 1980s and 1990s in East and some South Asian countries relied on a disproportionately high use of women in export-oriented manufacturing. Uh, this was the era of uh, trade liberalization, the opening up of, of semi-industrialized uh, sectors in the economy, electronics, uh, garments, um, uh, uh, other uh, semi-industrialized sectors as well. And these sectors were uh, no notably um, important uh, for the fact that they absorbed largely female, young female workers who had previously been in rural areas, uh, paying them low uh, wages that spurred uh, investment and exports, particularly because 
of uh, the low uh, unit labor uh, costs that they had, which provided the foreign exchange to purchase capital and intermediate goods that can raise productivity and generate uh, growth. Uh, there was a lot of work in this period um, that showed that women were workers were preferred because they were seen to be not just were they cheaper, but they seemed to be more flexible sources of labor. Uh, they were more docile. Um, and that was also uh, quite important. Women workers were willing to accept inferior um, conditions and pay. At the same time, there was a, um, a growing prevalence of informal employment because uh, while younger women uh, started as the labor force in many of the um, semi-industrialized factories, as they began to get married and have children, uh, they were left the factories and moved into other forms of work, largely uh, informal uh, work, piece rate uh, work, um, uh, uh, work at the bottom of multinational uh, supply chains, uh, home-based workers, uh, and, uh, and other, uh, other areas. Um, the sunrise industries of the late 20th century, uh, which was the emergence of electronics, computer hardware, consumer electronics, was also thought about uh, as being suitable for women because the high of high burnout rates and women could peri periodically be replaced. There was always a large uh, share of women who could be, who were not working, who could be absorbed uh, into uh, this type of employment. Um, it's important to note that the feminization of uh, labor in export-oriented industries was actually short-lived. There's still uh, a, a high share of women but um, we're down from now the peaks of where they were uh, in, in the 1990s. If we go to the next slide, uh, we can see that in post-2000 labor markets in Asia and the Pacific and the uh, types of industries uh, that were there uh, became much more polarized uh, because of largely technological change. Um, as countries were able to um, utilize their foreign exchange earnings as a result of low female uh, wages, they were able to grow, to become, become more capital intensive, become, uh, began to develop more higher skilled uh, types of employment. And as this technical cha technological change increased, um, more men became, uh, more men took over those types of jobs. Uh, 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 and so there was, uh, a replacement largely of the new jobs with male labor from the more routinized uh, type of work that and low semi-skilled work that women have been uh, doing. So uh, technical, technological transfer through trade was skill biased and it favored higher skilled workers, higher education workers, which were seen to be men. And some examples of where this pattern was happening was in Korea and Malaysia, where female labor and manufacturing declined as those company, economies moved up uh, the industrial ladder. And as more IT, uh, uh, tech companies started to grow in the services economy, financial services, and so forth, that trend um, continued. If we go to the next slide, I wanted to say that one of the things that's quite interesting, <laughs> um, Golden, uh, takes these kinds of structural changes and she matches them with what's happening, as I had mentioned, with uh, women's human capital accumulation uh, and with changes uh, in, um, in their uh, uh, fertility rates and reproductive technology. And I think one of the things that we can see happening over this period of time in East Asia and South Asia and the Pacific is that the fertility rate has totally fallen from 1960 to uh, 2000, where there were largely, uh, 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 in 1960, about six children per woman, moving down to two, uh, two uh, children. And in some economies, the fertility rate is uh, below replacement level. This is the economies of South Korea uh, and Japan. China is also facing um, 
of these issues. I'm going to touch on this a little bit later in the talk. And of course, um, education has uh, expanded. Uh, we see um, expansions in completion rates for lower, uh, particularly at the lower secondary. I'm sorry, I meant to show you a chart with uh, tertiary, uh, upper secondary and lower secondary completion. But one of the things that I think is interesting about the chart on the right is between 1995 and 2003, the female, um, uh, secondary, female secondary education has slightly surpassed male secondary education. Um, and that's true in the US as well. At the tertiary level, we have many more females graduating from universities and colleges in the United States than we do uh, young men. And this is actually uh, now a cause for concern in terms of some of the economic uh, implications. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, there's also been uh, changes in laws um, and uh, policies uh, over this period of time. The World Bank collects something called the Women, Business, and the Law Index. It tracks women's lives and careers across eight dimensions uh, related to, law, to um, lives and careers, mobility, uh, uh, how, how uh, much women can move around, uh, workplace, uh, pay, laws on marriage and divorce, laws on parenthood, uh, entrepreneurship, starting or running a business, uh, laws on assets, whether women uh, own property or can inherit property, and laws on pension. And I wanted to show you the subregions in the Asia uh, Pacific region relative to the black dotted line, which is the, um, the average of all countries reforming over time. But you can see the fastest reforms uh, uh, were in East Asia between 1971 and in 2023, whereas the slowest reforms have been in South Asia. And uh, somewhere in the middle uh, is the Central and Western Asia and uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. All countries do have examples of legal uh, of getting rid of legal economic uh, discrimination, but I have to say the uh, the the criticism of this is it shows you the de jure changes. It may not mean that the laws are being implemented and being followed by uh, changes in the economy in practice. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see that in spite of the progress on education, declines in fertility, uh, changes in, uh, in laws, progressive changes, uh, gender pay gaps remain, and gender uh, participation gaps also remain. One fundamental takeaway from Claudia's work is that, and I really like this, um, this summary, the source of the gender gap is not constant as society transfer transitions from one period of development to another. Rather, her work highlights which factors are most relevant, at which stages of economic development, and importantly, how multiple sources of gender gaps often interact with each other. So policies that are aimed at improving female educational attainment, which is an ambition of many countries today in the region, are not going to be effective at closing labor market gender gaps if social norms or institutional barriers or demand side factors keep women out of the workplace and certain jobs. And I wanted to turn to the next slide to show you that there are gender pay gaps still remaining uh, by occupational group in countries in Asia and the Pacific. This data comes from the ILO harmonized micro data. Uh, you can see that actually the uh, pay gaps are quite high uh, in some of the managerial positions and a lot lower in uh, some occupations like clerical support workers. And this is probably also due to another structural feature that Claudia pointed out in economies, uh, namely occupational segregation. So uh, in the clerical sector, largely clerical workers are women compared to men Whereas in some of these other uh, uh, occupations represented here, whether it's uh, managers in 
um, in information and communications technicians or in the legal uh, and social world, uh, the job uh, segregation has been largely male with women entering uh, some of these, um, these professions, these occupations at a somewhat slower rate. And occupational segregation uh, is characterized both uh, in terms of uh, horizontal uh, uh, segregation as well as vertical segregation. So women having a harder time, as we know, rising to the top and um, moving into uh, management and leadership uh, positions, and then horizontal segregation in terms of uh, workforces being um, segregated uh, by sex. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, more recently, uh, Claudia has started in her book on career and family has turned her focus to college-educated married women in the United States and a phenomenon that she terms greedy jobs. And her work on college-educated married women, I think, is extremely interesting. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because uh, that work may be somewhat more particular to the U.S. economy in terms of uh, highly educated uh, college women, with the exception perhaps of, of, of India, highly educated college women um, either dropping out of the labor force and interestingly enough, um, having more children than non-college educated uh, women. I'm going to uh, wrap up in just one minute, um, but let me just uh, make two comments about uh, greedy work. This is work that can be defined as a job that pays disproportionately more on a per hour basis when someone works a greater number of hours or has less control of these hours. All of these are quotes from Claudia in describing the type of work that has emerged largely in certain types of professions. If we go to the next slide, the question I have is, uh, whether uh, greedy uh, work applies to Asia and the uh, uh, Pacific. And the implications, I think, of greedy work for women um, is really important, uh, particularly in a context when unpaid care and domestic work is overwhelmingly done by women. Uh, uh, and some of the implications, I think, of this type of job of uh, these types of jobs are low and declining marriage rates, which we do see in specific countries in Asia and Pacific, and as I mentioned earlier, below replacement uh, fertility. Countries that seem to have emerging greedy work patterns, particularly in form of employment, might be Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. We all know the phenomenon of, of men working very, very long hours and at the beck and call um, uh, and somebody has to care for the kids. It's largely women who then go on the mommy track and absorb the consequences of uh, greedy work. If we go up, uh, let's skip the next slide and go to um, some of the other important differences in Asia and Pacific from the United States. Golden's work focuses on the formal sector but in many Asia Pacific countries, informal employment opportunity, uh, employment, informal employment predominates, predominates. And one thing I do have to say that I think might be an interesting concept to explore is whether there are greedy uh, jobs in the informal sector. So for instance, domestic workers who might be largely women who might be at the beck and call of their employers. So we might want to think about extending this concept of greedy jobs uh, to uh, non-formally employed uh, people. I want to just wrap up by thinking a little bit about some of the future trends, which um, I think are important and likely which uh, Claudia and others will start to think about in the context of structural economic transformation. I think there's two phenomena that will uh, be really important for where our economies go next. The first is the climate transition, the transition to net zero and the implications for transitions in the energy sector and in uh, the quote unquote manufacturing sector. Uh, how are we going to replace those jobs um, that are just the workers and the jobs displaced by decarbonization and moving away from fossil fuels? Can we actually start to create 
uh, uh, green jobs that are not characterized by occupational segregation. Um, there's been a lot of work on uh, as, uh, as labor forces transition, making the care sector much more of uh, an, a sector for investment and job creation. I could talk about that uh, in the discussion. The second major transition is the implications of AI, particularly for service sector jobs and other things. One uh, recent study that I saw uh, showed that for generative AI, it's the clerical sector that's increasingly at risk and we may not have those jobs in 10 to 15 years. So what would that imply for the women who have been very large in that sector? So just to conclude, I think her work shows us that it's not the demand side or the supply side of economic growth and job creation, it's both. Uh, we need to pay much more attention to climate change uh, and uh, AI for female employment and earnings. Uh, and uh, we need to think about the kind of structural uh, policies and changes that will help make women's employment uh, trade-offs going forward a lot less difficult. And those are the kinds of, uh, of questions that Claudia has raised uh, and is now part of the economic uh, policy analyst toolkit. That, let me stop here and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karen, for this really broad, sweeping, and at the same time, comprehensive perspective that you've provided on Claudia Golden's work and how it relates uh, to, uh, to the Asia-Pacific region. Indeed, you're right. The Asia-Pacific region is really diverse in terms of where the economies are in, in terms of structural transformation, the duality of the formal and formal the legal discrimination, the chart that you showed was pretty fascinating, as well as experience of uh, institutional norms, uh, like the experience of child penalties, which um, I know you skipped over, but again, shows a lot of variation between these countries. Um, I think Golden provides a very useful lens to think of some of these issues, but uh, future trends perhaps might force us to think beyond um, what Golden has proposed. And I think you also talk mention about it in your last slide. So let me turn to Albert. Albert, given your perch as the senior economist uh, and looking over uh, the region and looking at broad economic trends, um, would you comment on how the labor market in the region is evolving? It's really dynamic, uh, particularly thinking about gig work, transition to the green economy. Um, Karen's also talked about AI. What do you think are some of the challenges and opportunities this presents for women's labor force participation? And what is ADB, what is ADB's role uh, in, uh, in sort of thinking about these challenges? Uh, what work is ADB doing in the region? Thank you so much, Emma. And you know, I wanna say also, I was really thrilled that Claudia won the Nobel Prize this year. Um, I've known her for a long time, and um, one way she describes herself is as a detective uh, trying to find evidence to really reveal the truth of history, and I think it's a very good lesson for uh, us in the research department at ADB trying to really use evidence to inform policy-relevant issues. Um, and the other thing I think is an important message from her historical research is that you know she does find that what is driving changes in uh, labor force participation of women uh, changes over time. And so we can't be complacent, I think, as researchers. We have to keep investigating. And, and this relates to your question, what's going on today in labor markets and what are the big forces that are affecting women? And I think we all appreciate that uh, technological change is the key driver of many of the changes we're seeing in the labor market, especially digitalization. And this was accelerated by the pandemic, which also introduced new types of work and ways of working. And all of these have implications for women. So let me just point out a few um, phenomenon that are important. One is uh, digitalization has brought uh, a really rapid increase in digital services trade. Uh, so business process outsourcing is an important growing sector in the Philippines and in India uh, and some other economies and will likely continue to be so. We know that women in general uh, are more are employed more in service sectors, but in 
particular in uh, BPO business process outsourcing, we see higher rates of uh, female employment and even promotion of females to managerial positions. So that perhaps is uh, a positive direction. The second is the gig economy, which you mentioned, which has been facilitated by platforms uh, that allow people to work much more flexibly. Now, in generally, we think more flexible work arrangements also is beneficial uh, to women uh, because it allows them to uh, more easily engage in work uh, when they have other priorities as well. But one of the concerns raised by the digital, uh, the gig economy is whether these are really high quality jobs or they're informal jobs without social insurance. So are these good jobs for women? And I think um, there's a lot of work being done now to think about how to regulate dig uh, gig economy, to deliver uh, basic social insurance programs. And that's ongoing, I think, in a number of countries and is important to watch. A third issue is the explosion of work from home during the pandemic. Uh, which is now more accepted by many employers. And again, by increasing flexibility, it should be beneficial for women to stay engaged in the labor market. The fourth is the green economy. And we had a presentation uh, sometime earlier this year, uh, a, a study by LinkedIn about uh, women in the green economy. And the basic conclusion was that women um, are less engaged in the green economy relative to men. Um, one of the... Uh, kind of uh, really nice phenomenon is the catch up of women in terms of educational attainment that was in one of the slides, because that suggests that the earlier biases towards high skill work will not necessarily disadvantage women. But I think if we think about green economy, there's more of a focus on engineering jobs. And uh, so it still matters kind of what women are studying and what they're training for and what kinds of skills uh, they're developing. Uh, but I think we're still early days in the uh, green transition, and that's important. Um, and uh, finally, I agree entirely with the point about AI, and I think that's a really an important area for us to start researching right away. I think we're going to see really exponential adoption of AI going forward. Uh, so uh, you asked about um, ADB's role. Uh, you know, ADB has set a gender equality as one of the st strategic priorities of the bank, so we consider how every project we do uh, impacts women um, and try to uh, improve the design features of our projects to uh, benefit women or maximize the benefits for women. But I think um, at the policy level, we need to really think out of the box and we need to really keep investigating new ways of trying to address these issues. I mean, there are some that are well studied, uh, like trying to improve access to childcare, which we know is helpful. But I think what we're finding in the region is that because you see these huge differences in female labor participation, especially South Asia, very low, you know, Pacific higher, um, even Nepal is one of the highest. It, a lot of this comes back to social norms. And I think we need to think more seriously about how we can directly impact social norms through culture, role models. Uh, so there's an interesting, uh, well-known paper in economics saying that novellas in Brazil, these TV shows uh, presented really uh, empowered women as role models and had a big effect on fertility outcomes in Brazil. Um, and uh, the other thing is we have to be patient. There's a lot of research which suggests that it's often um, the next generation that you have to impact. In other words, if you have a new uh, policy or program it may not, you may not get a big reaction from current uh, uh, workers because, or fertility, because they've already kind of planned their lives. But for younger girls and adolescents who, who are starting to plan their lives and look to the future, if they see the environment changing around them, then it can be impactful. And that should also should be a focus. Let me stop there, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Albert. In fact, your concluding thought is one that I think Claudia Golden also does in her cohort analysis. She talks about um, aspirations and how those aspirations change across cohorts. Uh, some fascinating points, uh, and uh, if we have time, I'll get back to you, but I would like to invite uh, Maya 
who is our Workplace Gender Equality Director at Investing in Women. Uh, Maya, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've talked about your work in the Business Coalition in the four countries, and you've often mentioned that your work serves as a bridge between Golden's work and practical applications. Yes. Uh, so, A, I first want you to explain what you mean by this bridge between um, sort of academia and industry <laughs> and the practical applications. And perhaps you can also give us some examples of initiatives that private sector members of the Business Coalition are using to retain and increase the number of women in the workforce. Over to you, Maya. Thank you, Hema. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, good, uh, good evening for Karen. So uh, let me just start by uh, introducing Investing in Women, which is a multi-country Australian government initiative in Southeast Asia that seeks to accelerate women's economic empowerment through increased and equitable opportunities in the private sectors, contributing to inclusive, sustainable economic recovery and growth in targeted countries. So we use innovative approach to catalyze women's economic participation and strengthen the enabling environment for women's economic empowerment, including workplace gender equality, which is the unit that I'm, I'm managing now, uh, enabling policy reform focus on the care economy, uh, campaign and community of practices. This is something that related to what Albert mentioned before about social norm and gender lens in fasting. So in Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Myanmar, investing in women support business coalition that work with influential businesses on shifting workplace cultures, practices, and policy barriers to achieve workplace gender equality. Um, over 100 member companies, many of whom are the region's uh, private sector leaders and biggest employers, together employ over 1 million people. So responding to Karen's lecture that we heard before about uh, fertility rates and also how women represented in the workforce, I would like to share some of the policies and practices that member companies of the business coalitions have done to keep the female employees within their workforce while they are in the marriage and childbearing stages. So one of the members, which is a tech company, analyzed further the assessment result that the business coalition conducted, which is found out, which they found out that more than 80% of their female employees who resigned from the company were uh, the first time mother. So to respond to these uh, situations, the company developed the specific flexible working arrangement for the female employees who returned from maternity leave as the initiative to keep the female employees dropping out from their workforce, which is still a, a male-dominated sectors. So other members, which is a consulting firm, developed similar initiatives named Gradual Return to Work Program, which aim to provide flexibility after maternity leave. They even started the program back in 2017, 2018, when the workplace gender equality is still starting as a topic to discuss uh, in order to keep their female employees to stay in the workforce. When I had the interview with this company, I asked them, so what is it you know, in this program uh, trying to keep women within their workforce? The answer is simple because those women are our profit makers. If they go or drop out from our workforce, there goes our profit, which is very business oriented, right? Another example that I can give is a manufacturing companies who set up a team with multiple technical skill, which can be deployed to cover the female employees who are in the maternity leave. So uh, the companies is comprising 65% women and 35% of men. The team comprises of factory workers, both male and female, but predominantly female actually, who have been trained in various work units. Therefore, they have multiple technical skills, which allowing them to deploy to any unit who needs support when, when one of the team members is going to maternity leave. The initiative derived from the idea to keep the productivity level while they must comply with labor law about maternity leave. While it, while it may not directly respond to prevent women dropping from the workforce, the initiative is actually make the male uh, supervisors of the companies to be less resistant in hiring women, though they know that these young women will go on maternity leave someday. 
So I think um, when we talk about flexible working that uh, benefiting women more uh, on this part, I think it's also uh, I think it's also worth to to notice that uh, I agree with Karen. The flexibility only is not enough, but it also has to be followed with uh, the the changes and the, uh, the structural changes of the policies and practices that will not discriminating women on these childbearing stages from promotions or uh, from job opportunities that will have them, you know, um, skills that needed in the futures. I think the manufacturing companies that we also assisted um, increasing the number of women in the engineering, uh, in their uh, engineers group, while, while uh, you know, by giving them the trainings and also uh, the education for to be more women to be in the technical uh, roles within the companies. It, this is just the some of the example that we have uh, from the region. I know the, the sample is still small, but if we keep doing this, I agree with Albert, the, the effort is not, on, is not for our generation, but uh, for the next generation to come. Um, I'll stop here with my explanation. Thank you, Hema. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, I do recall in one of our earlier conversations, you had said that uh, businesses want practicality. They don't necessarily want to hear about uh, gender equality. And I think we sometimes forget that when we're sort of talking with industry people. Um, so I'm going to, we are pretty close uh, on time. And so we've said we'll extend it by a few minutes so that we can take a couple of questions that have popped in. Um, and this question, I think, is really, uh, it, it, the floor is open to everyone, but perhaps uh, this would be of interest to Karen. Uh, uh, Milan asks that, uh, says that in some questions, uh, in some countries of developing Asia, there are concerted efforts to reduce informality and grow the tax base through fiscal reforms. And how can such reforms be designed to minimize unintended negative consequences for gender inequality in the labor market? That's a really good and important uh, question. Uh, in my one of my hats in my day job, I um, work on taxation. Uh, I actually think that right now um, there's a big focus on how countries can mobilize domestic resources in a more um, efficacious and egalitarian way um, so that they can support the type of expenditure that will help in, uh, put in place the enabling conditions uh, for women to participate in paid employment uh, to have, uh, uh, and do other uh, things. And I think there's some basic tenets right now, which is um, that we're learning from some research uh, that I've been involved in in other continents in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think the effort should be completely focused on um, improving the progressivity of the tax system uh, in the sense of not just uh, improving progressive taxes on labor income of those who are formerly employed, but really closing loopholes and exemptions uh, related to taxation of capital income uh, and uh, beginning to think about wealth taxation. There's a big movement around the world right now uh, for wealth taxes, uh, and that would relieve some of the pressure of what we call informal taxes or fees on those who are informally employed. For instance, there's been some great research in countries like Ghana and Uganda to show the type of what we call nuisance taxes on informal traders or uh, market uh, vendors. But we need a much more uh, effective uh, tax base. Um, I, I don't think the issue is just registering firms. Um, I think the registration has to be uh, linked to the, uh, uh, and for firms, I think that one other thing for firms to uh, want to become more formal and to pay taxes, 
We also have to think about how public services can be delivered more effectively to populations. And I think that will be important for enhancing willingness to pay or tax compliance. Uh, and I think right now many governments and local governments are cash strapped as we think about federal tax systems, they devolve a, a responsibility for expenditure to subnational units, but they don't devolve revenue. So we have to think about how we're gonna grow the revenue base of localities. And often that is through property taxes and land taxes. And I there we think we do need uh, proper registration systems for um, registering property and measuring the value of property and probably getting some of the higher net worth property owners into the system. Thank you, Karen. Um, I have another question. Uh, it's about security of tenure and contractual jobs that women often find themselves in. Um, so if they take time off from these jobs, how can they be afforded protection uh, and what sort of working arrangements can be there when they go back into their jobs after they take some time off? Anybody want, would like to answer this question? Perhaps Albert should take this and then I could come in. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so this is um, a challenge. I mean, it goes to some of the very fundamental trade-offs that you know Claudia's work has highlighted between uh, prioritizing work versus prioritizing um, having children and taking care of um, family members. And so I'm not sure there's an easy solution here. Obviously, um, it would be great if men shared in the shared sacrifices to career. We have more uh, paternal leave policies now that are available. Um, I think the research shows that maternal leave policies um, kind of delay uh, women in terms of how long they can stay out of the labor force to take care of kids, but ultimately doesn't have a big effect on their ultimate uh, career uh, progression beyond kind of, I mean, I think many women are looking for more flexible arrangements and again, uh, steer away from greedy jobs. And this shows up as labor market differences, but um, obviously these can't, these are not necessarily welfare differences if they are maximizing joint welfare with uh, uh, job strategies with their uh, spouses. But certainly uh, we need to um, just ease the costs of these types of trade-offs uh, to um, either through regulation or through investment or information, uh, help employers to allow women to get their careers back on tra track after they leave the labor force uh, for children and um, and provide uh, supports uh, for women who want to get back into the labor force, like child care access, et cetera, uh, that will increase the, you know, their career, improve their career pro progression going forward. Claudia uh, proposes uh, that we need to make a lot more uh, of the greedy jobs into flexible kind of work, uh, more flexible arrangements to equalize flexibility. I do think uh, it's really important to take a look at the structure of greedy jobs, which I think forces highly educated, particularly highly educated women onto a mommy track and men onto the bread earning track. And we see that certainly uh, in the United States and there's some really interesting anecdotal evidence. Um, I, I think it's very extreme in some of the countries in East Asia, when you look at South Korea, um, Japan is interesting to me because uh, uh, only recently I have seen increases in female labor force participation in Japan. So I don't know if that's only married women or that's uh, different segments of women. So it'd be interesting. Japan, of course, has been trying to increase female labor force participation for many years. Um, but I think that we have to do more work to think uh, structurally about where the economy is. I don't think it's also, just to say one more thing to Albert, I don't think it's only norms. I think it's really job creation and it's getting past some of the institutional barriers um, to women being able to access those jobs. Thanks, Karen. Maya, would you like to uh, 
add uh, your thoughts to this from say a business perspective of how one could really maintain uh, yeah. flexible work arrangements yet not sort of lose out on the career path? Well, I think uh, uh, back again, um, for business, it's really uh, looking at, uh, you know, the investment. Uh, for them, these policies, it's part of the investment. But how far the investment uh, could wait for that, uh, for, for the business. And I think uh, it's go back again uh, to the condition. I mean, for the countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, the cost of maternity leave, it's uh, being, you know, 100% uh, covered by the employers. So if we're talking about extending maternity leaves to give women more time, that surely will make women being discriminated directly. If direct impact is being discriminated uh, in uh, in the labor uh, force, uh, one of the thing is uh, joint forces between uh, government and employers. How to tackle that? And I think like the Australia provided that that the government will cover some portions of the. Uh, of the cost, and then the government uh, also covers some of the cost for that. Uh, back again to the situation, if women wants to be uh, stay in the workforce as well, it's providing that that structural, uh, uh, you know, providing structural changes that, uh, and also the productivity. How you count the productivity? If the counting of the productivity is based on the greedy job, just like what Karen said, you know, stay in the office for 40 hours a day or 40 hours a week or so, yes, uh, women will be, you know, uh, naturally, you know, drop out from the workforce when they have the childbearing situation. But if the productivity is being counted by their deliverables, I think it will change the uh, it will change the narrative and also uh, uh, you know the playing and leveling the playing field for women to be uh, stay in the workforce. So I think that's my comment on that one, Emma. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Maya, uh, we've and thank you to all our speakers. We've not only come to the end of our scheduled time, we've actually run over time, um, and I'm very mindful that it's 11 p.m. for Karen in the US. So I'd like to take this opportunity to wrap up, but this was a really interesting discussion and lots of ideas for future research, uh, I think both from a practical as well as academic and policy point of view. Um, we'd like to thank our speakers, our keynote speaker and our panelists and also the audience. I know uh, you've put in quite a few questions, um, uh, but we've uh, not been able to answer all of these, but I think we've got some interesting discussion and food for thought. Before we close today's webinar, I would also like to invite you to join our next Asian Impact webinar on the Asian Development Outlook um, April 2024 launch. This will be held on 11th April 2024, Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m. Manila time via Zoom. Please do check out our AIW webinar page and the Chief Economist X account for more updates. And thank you very much for joining us this morning, this evening, Karen, and goodbye.